Um, so uh, welcome along to our third session this week. We've had sessions on Monday and Tuesday. We hope that some of you were able to come and join us on those. Do let us know if you were at those and let us know how you um, felt they went and, and what you thought about the topics that were being talked about. It was really interesting to hear. And um, what I really like is that we've really got quite a, a broad range of speakers this week, which is really brilliant. We've got quite a different take on some of what open source and open data means for different people and different angles in the way that people are talking about it, which is really brilliant and really good to hear. Um, I'm Sam. I'm one of the organisers of Pi Data Edinburgh, which is one of the tech meetups uh, based in Edinburgh. And this event has been organised primarily by the Edinburgh R group, and um, we've kind of joined forces with them to make sure that some of these speakers get seen by all of our different groups. Um, so I'm really pleased to see such a, a, a big group of people coming along at lunchtime and giving up your time to come and listen to our speakers. So thanks so much. Um, between us, our groups have over 2,000 people. Um, I said yesterday, I'm not sure what the overlap is, so that's not unique users. So I, I didn't have time to go and pull out the data to do a full analysis. So what I did was a total random selection of five people from our tech meetup and I went and I looked at the different groups that they were members of. So of our five members, three of those members are also members of the Edinburgh R group and the other two I actually couldn't see the groups they were members of because they'd hidden their data. So um, I thought that was quite a good sign that it seems to be we've got quite a good overlap in terms of number of people and I think certainly I'd, I'd love to hear about some of the, the community groups that are in um, the other areas that you're based in, Edinburgh has a really thriving tech community group. We're all volunteers. We do all of this stuff in our own time and organise these events. And it's been really fantastic. I should absolutely thank the organisers from Edinburgh R for suggesting this in the first place to come together as two groups and, and run these events. It's really great. We had never met before. So actually, it's been a really nice opportunity for us as well to, to make some new connections and find some, some other people working in very similar areas to us. So, um, uh, on to today. We've got two fantastic speakers and actually um, Hilary, who's going to speak for us first, Hilary Juma, is um, coming at it from an angle of being um, a community manager with the Mozilla Foundation. And I am absolutely fascinated to hear about that because a big part of what we do, what we do for these tech meetups is about creating community and creating um, environments where beginners can learn and ask questions. Um, those that are experienced and want to be able to share that knowledge can come along and help and build skills in other people and show them what they are doing. And a big thing we like to do is actually get people sharing some of what they don't do right and the things that go wrong because actually sometimes that's the biggest place of learning for others as well to see that we all get it wrong at times. So Hilary, I am really looking forward to hearing your take on, on our world of, of open data. So um, Hilary's talk is going to be about create, uh, yeah, I can't even speak, curating community <laughs> um, and uh, has a vast amount of experience about uh, community engagement in the data science world and beyond. So really looking forward to that one, Hilary. Our second Second speaker we have um, Arvind Smith. Um, he is a product manager at GitHub and he's also founder of the Journal of Open Source Software. I hope I've got that right. And um, I believe we're going to hear more about that in the talk. So Arvind, really looking forward to hearing that as well. Again, brilliant to see these things like resources that give us all extra information and extra opportunity to learn about what else is going on out there. So really looking forward to that one as well. Thank you. Um, I just want to highlight how to ask questions. There is chat within Blue Jeans itself, but we also have our Matrix group. Now, I'm going to hand over at this point to Greg to tell you a little bit more about Matrix and what that is. Thank you, Sam. I'll keep it quick. Um... As, as you said, we have a matrix room. The intention here is that because this is a week-long event, we don't want the chat to disappear at the end of each hour-long session. Rather, we'd like to build a community around uh, the concepts that we're talking about this week and to keep the discussions going into the future. Uh, to that end, matrix uh, is a, a much better place to do something like that. Uh, I know, for example, Mozilla use matrix as well internally, which is uh, really nice. And uh, so I encourage you all to join the Matrix room. The link is in chat. And if you can't see it, you can't find it, just put a message in BlueJeans and I'll repeat it. Please don't worry if, you, if you're having trouble getting onto Matrix or anything like that. Ask your questions in BlueJeans if you need to, and I will relay them across to Matrix so that we've got it all in one place. Uh, other than that, have a great time. I'll see you in the chat room. Looking forward to the talks.
Thanks so much, Greg. Um, so we will do a joint Q&A at the end of both the talks, but throughout the talks, please fire in any of the questions that you have into the chat. And I believe Hilary might have a little bit of interaction that she wants to do, a little bit of interactivity as we go through. So um, you might have some extra stuff to fire in there, but we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and make sure everything's relayed back to the speakers as we need to. And then um, at the end of both the talks, uh, with whatever time we have remaining, we'll go through the questions. So please uh, feel free to contribute. We really want to hear from all of you. This is all about you know what you can learn from, from the, the speakers that we've got along today as well. So really looking forward to hearing your questions as well as um, what the speakers have to say. Um, I think that is enough from me at this point. Um, and on that note, I am going to hand over to Hilary as our first speaker. Thank you so much, Hilary, and um, please take it away. Um, thank you so much, Sam, and for the team for inviting me to present and um, talk to you today about curating community. So as mentioned, my name is Hilary, um, and I'm going to be sharing with you some of my experience of being a community manager, as well as examples that have inspired me. So by the end of this talk, I hope to empower you in your understanding of curating community. I believe that each person in this session today has expertise in this, either by being a member of a community such as Edinburgh R and Pi Data, or by volunteering their time. As we're all experts, this presentation will have interactive elements inside. There will either be a question or fill in the blank. So please feel free to share your thoughts on the matrix and it will be really relayed back to me in the conversation. So my next slide is actually our first question. So our first question is, what distinguishes a community from an audience? Love to hear your thoughts. I'll give you like 20 to 30 seconds to like kind of think about your thoughts in regards to this. Um, and I'll just pause. Feels like some inspiration as well. Think about like your own experiences of being part of the community or an audience. Um, is it a community that you used to be part of or you're currently part of um, or is it an event that you attended? Um, feel free to add. Is there any responses yet, Greg? Brilliant. We've got um, we've got lots of stuff coming through on our on our matrix chat. So we have a two way interaction. Mm -hmm. We have engagement. Dialogue participation, everyone can have an influence, belonging, audience is only there for a short time, so the duration. Uh, I think that's it for now. Oh, here's another one. Um, ownership and invested, mm -hmm. collaboration, learning from each other, active, um, a slightly longer one here, an audience will largely consume, a community is invited to participate, contribute and share ownership. Thank you. And that last one is literally what I was about to describe the community as. So thank you everyone for like your contributions. And I, I really like the ways in which everyone's described and distinguished the differences between a community and an audience. And like, just to summarise my own thoughts. And my thoughts are audiences receive an experience like a consumer. In contrast, communities are deeply invested and have the opportunity to determine what experience they have like a member. So, um, so one of the ways in which I've understood community from a community management perspective, and I'll go into explaining like my experiences of being a community manager, is so from the community development handbook, which is on gov.uk. So essentially it creates this framework for understanding what community is, and it consists of three core parts, so people, so the community members and its managers, program, the day-to-day -day activities and overall direction, and then third, the platform, which is the online and offline spaces that in, that interaction and activity happens. And these core things interacting bring together what essentially community is. And I like some, like referring back to some of the examples you gave, like ownership, like those are principles on showing how you can act, at, um, you, you practice being a community. So, um, which I'll also expand on in a bit. So, before joining Mozilla, I was a data science community and engagement manager based in the Office for National Statistics. My role was to create and support um, and uh, support community activities that brought together data science practitioners and enablers in the UK public sector. In fact, that's actually how I know Mike, who is part of the open the coding and open team today. So, 
Um, some activities are listed on the screen that I've helped to create, such as data ethics and society reading group, with which I helped to create with colleagues, um, the data science community of interest meetups, which used to happen every two to three months, and our annual conference um, that has been both virtual and in person. I'll go more into depth with some of these activities as I share with you what you can consider whilst curating community. So currently I am, well, as of literally last week, Monday, I started my role as a Common Voice Community Manager at Mozilla. So what is Common Voice and why is this important? When was the last time you used voice technology? Was it when you were reading the subtitles, when you were on a Zoom call? Was it when you were trying to speak with your bank on the phone and had to go through an automated caller to put through to the right, to be put through to the right person? Do you also happen to have an accent or speak in a language that the voice recognition doesn't recognize? Voice recognition technology is being is, is a is a key aspect of how we interact with the digital world. And it's so important that we are enabling everyone to have the opportunity to not be left behind. So Common Voice is a community-led project to build a multilingual open source data set that can be used to train voice recognition models. The data set currently has 60 languages from Kirwanda to Italian. As a community manager, my role is to support the Common Voice community by advocating for the communities we have and, in, and ensuring community engagement is open to everyone. So my next question is this, why did you join a community? Feel free to add your thoughts into the matrix and I'll give it 20 seconds and then Sam, if it's okay, if you can relay me back the um, input. Absolutely. Thanks. Is there any responses at the moment? Could you share? Do, like, yes. Could you share free if that's okay? Of course. Um, so we have to repay the help that I was given when I started a project and um, because I believed in its aims. Um, they needed a skill I could offer and I thought it would be useful for the audience. And then to develop my skills. And then we've just got one other short one on there at the moment. So for inspiration. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts as to like why you joined a community. And like, I think that's really powerful, those stories about like knowledge sharing, building connections and like giving back. Um, so I think one of the key things to think about when you're creating community essentially is the why. So um, the why is like the big why question. So um, one of so just to mention, just so it helps you following the rest of this presentation, on of each of the following slides, I like, explain the aspects of curating community. On the left hand side there'll be a case study and then on the right hand side there'll be like a toolbox of resources you can look to to like deepen your knowledge because I, what, a lot of my experience with community management and learnings has been from other people as well as in learning from my own community networks that I have. Um, so as I mentioned the first thing you need to ask is your why. You may observe this by looking at your environment. So like the desire to foster a movement that brings together environmental change in the local area, finding people who enjoy open source tools. Um, another one may be enabling the sharing of tacit knowledge, which isn't, which isn't as transferable from textbooks. So to give you an example, in the, in, in the early days of the data science community in Gov, members recognised that they needed to understand the art of the possible in the public sector. Developing a community helped to enable space for the sharing of tacit knowledge between government and public sector departments as they develop their data science capability. So um, community platforms such as the Government Data Science Slack were introduced to help serve a similar function to Stack Overflow as a way to provide help for, for um, provide help and support on the doing of data science in the public sector. And I think the why also is quite important in regards to informing the social identity of the community. So on the toolbox I've referred to pages 7 to 18 of cultivating communities by Emily, Emily Weber, which is a really amazing book. And in those books, um, in those pages, she shares like how, why, why you need a community and how like it could be very important to su supporting the sharing of tacit knowledge because people can use, for example, um, sessions such as this to share their own experiences and practices of applying and doing open source. Cool. So the next thing that I think is really important when you're curating community, once you've established your why, it's really important to visualize your network. So, um, and when I say visualize your network is because those are people that will support you in regards to like 
possibly being community members or even advocating for you. And in order to do this, you need to be able to communicate courageously. So, um, so one of the quotes that I've been inspired by whilst like researching and doing this presentation is um, from the Open Leadership Framework by Mozilla. So like one of the things is you'll be far more effective as a leader when you have your own mentors, cheerleaders, supporters. These are people who can encourage and advise you. They'll be your closest allies in you create, in creating this project. And that could be similarly applied to um, for communities. So during my own role as the data science community manager, I worked closely with the government data science, data science partnership members who include representation from Office of National Statistics and Government Digital Service. They helped me, um, they helped us support me as a community manager by, by both providing funding for annual conferences to also advocating for the community within their own networks like a sponsor. So like your support network can really help in regards to like advocating as mentioned earlier. So once you've kind of established your network, it's really important to communicate courageously as mentioned earlier. And storytelling is a really powerful tool in helping you share that with your support network. You may use analogies, creative mediums to demonstrate the values of people. Some of your social networks might even support and some others, some others might not, but that's still okay. The important thing is that you're communicating, communicating courageously regardless of how your support network responds. And this is something you have to continuously practice. And you can use things such as listening sprints and inviting people to come in and hear your idea in regards to like what the community could look like and what it could possibly solve. Um, and like um, to give an example of like how this is something that you also not just have to do beginning of the community but throughout. Um, so what I was project managing government data science festival, which was basically an online version of our annual conference. Um, I had to look for strand leads to help support the different um, topic strands that we have throughout the festival, such as like machine learning, geospatial, et cetera. To reinforce the community call, I asked people in my, my support network who I knew had specialities in this topic area to see if they would be interested in supporting. And, and those that did come forward, that, that they provided immense value to the festival. So just to wrap up this slide, um, in the toolbox, I've referred to the open leadership training and there's a chapter on building communities and visualizing and within that visualizing your support network is in there. So I really encourage you to check that out and all of the slides and stuff will be shared afterwards with you. So don't have to worry about like Googling stuff um, throughout this. Cool. So the next thing once you like know who your support network is, is establishing a strategy. So um, and this allows you to um, to continuously co um, to communicate as to how you're responding to the why. So whilst I was working with one of the communities as a, in the data science community called the text analytics community, one of the things we created was a community charter to help us establish our strategy for how the community would run. We use um, the community of practice charter, which is listed in the toolbox, to help us think about the purposes, roles and ways of working. To create the charter, we, we hosted the meetup um, that also featured the show and tell to also highlight like how text analytics is being used in, in the public sector. Um, and then also before the meetup, we encourage members to fill out an anonymous survey so that they, they could see, um, so they could see like both the skill sets of what the community has and then also um, their interests and the ways in which they prefer to engage. So at the meetup, we share these responses and workshop ideas on, um, on three different areas. And in the next meetup, we then ratify the charter and develop and further develop the plan into how we're gonna deliver the charter's goals. So essentially, a community strategy will have to reflect the community needs and the context of where the community lives. Um, and when I say lives, like, let's say, for example, my, in my aspect, the first community that I was working with is a knowledge based community in the, in, the, uh, um, in the professional world. And the current community I'm supporting is a project based community. So um, I think of strategy like a consultation guide that guides your specific community into the direction of travel. Um, it should cover questions such as the vision of the community, who is your support network, how can everyone participate, how can we communicate as a community, and how do we how how do we know our engagement activities are successful? So just to reinforce, definitely check out those tools on the toolbox. So such as the data management plan, um, as a way to think about how you're managing and looking after people's personal data. Because when you're um, say for example using um, things such as Slack, you are engaging with people's personal data. Um, I've put the link of a research data management plan into the presentation, partly because I've seen that's where that practice mainly comes from, and I think it can be used and extrapolated to communities. 
Cool. So the next book in regards to evaluation, which is linked to strategy, is like thinking about how do you know when your community is like essentially being successful. So I first came across this idea of the spaces model in the business of belonging by David Spinks, which seeks to better align business goals with the community. That being said, it can still be a valuable way to consider metrics for all types of communities. Let's take, for example, a learning community. So a metric for, for demonstrating the ways in which you're supporting the community could be the rate of unanswered questions in the community forum. A metric of where you're showing that like your the community activities are aligned to your purpose is we are using like things such as member satisfaction surveys. A metric you could use for demonstrating that you're advocating um, that, that the advocacy, um, so in, encouraging new members could be like the, the, the rate of the new members for a period of the year. Um, a, way, a way of um, using a metric for showing contributions towards a community could be um, data or code contributions to like a community learning book or even let's say for example in learning community like a the creation of a course. Um, a metric for engagement could be um, how many active members attend community activities consistently and then also success could be like in the, in the context of a learning community like the skills progression for members. Um, so like let's say for example the person had started um, learning intro to R and now that like they um, know how to like use R and apply it um, do machine learning whilst using R as well. So those are different ways to think about like how you can use metrics as a way to really like assess consistently and throughout the community like how how it's going. But that being said, like numbers aren't everything. It's really important to have conversations with community members and use listening and sprints throughout um, the time whilst you're curating with community. I think it's lastly one of the things just to really highlight is like it's really important that you do um, create these metrics together with people like you don't do it in a silo um, and also as I mentioned earlier like the data management plan can be a useful way to describing and explaining to people how we're using personal data and you want to ensure that you're not doing it in a way that's like privacy invasive as well um, so yeah so I have another question because I'd love to hear your opinion on the following fill out the blank Community leadership is dot, dot, dot. Shall I go for it? We've got a few answers. Cool. Um, the, word, share. the word hard appears a few times. <laughs> so that only counts as one answer. Um, another one, reflective of the community. Mm -hmm. Hard appeared again up just now. Um, and there's also enabling others and getting out of the way. Cool. Thank you so much for everyone's contributions. And just as a quick question, Sam, how am I doing for time, just in general? Let me just, just do double check. check. Uh, you've got about five minutes. Okay, cool. I'm going to try and whiz through this. Um, so thank you, everyone, for your contributions to that. And like, I really like that you shared the vulnerability of community leadership, both that it can be hard, but also like the aspect of delegation and moving out of the way. So. I'd like to describe community leadership as open, and I really want to encourage you to check out the open leadership framework, which I'll be touching on throughout this the rest of the presentation. But essentially, um, the open leadership framework is a set of principles and practices, skills people can use to mobilize their communities to solve shared problems and, share, and achieve goals. It was created by colleagues at, um, at Mozilla. So using the framework can highlight ways in which you can demonstrate this when you're curating community. Um, I've, I've linked to the GitHub um, link repository of the framework and there's also like a, a supplementary training resource as part of it. So essentially when I mean open community leadership is open, openness is described in the open leadership framework as understanding, sharing and participation. So understanding meaning work is accessible and clear as well as transparent about project structure. Two, sharing, so it's adapting, reproducible and spreads with people that are engaged with, um, engaging with the project or community and participation and inclusion. So shared ownership, agency, inviting, relevant and safe for all. So like there's a table that's in the open leadership framework, which kind of highlights both the ways in which the principles, which is the understanding, sharing practices and design, um, build and empower, which are the actual ways you can practice doing open leadership and I will quickly go through some of these examples. So firstly, one of the ways in which um, you can practice open leadership is like through design. 
So design is about making contextual and deliberate decisions about how and when to be open. So to give you a few case studies, so um, in the whilst I was a community manager, there was a session. Well, one of one of the things that different departments do is coffee and coding. And essentially, coffee and coding is like this hour where people share what they're working on in regards to like a code project. So let's say, for example, how they can make tests better in Python and etc. And one of the key things about coffee and coding is that there's a public repository about that shares both when the sessions are happening as well as like when um, as well as resources from the talk. So let's say, for example, code um, so people can share and in their own time go through sometimes those sessions of tutorials and that's quite useful. Another case study I'd like to highlight is um, Hexi time. So in the framework, they talk about um, on the build the importance of information sharing focus. And Hexi Time essentially was this amazing tool and platform created by um, John and Hesham, who are health practitioners, who, were part who partnered with the Q community. And essentially, colleagues can offer and provide one-to-one um, -one sharing of skills. So um, to give like a quote of someone that's used the platform, um, using Hexi Time enabled um, we need to level the play, levels the playing field of connecting and exchanging and not being based on hierarchy, tech, title or seniority, but on skills, knowledge and demonstrating one's function doesn't determine their value or the value of their skills and experience. So I think that quote highlights like how you can use things such as like time, essentially time banking as a principle and a practice to share and distribute knowledge. And like the way in which a platform works is very open. You can see all of the offers that um, people have and as well as requests people have. Um, so it really does enable that sharing. So I'd really encourage you to check out that. So um, another aspect of open leadership is build. So creating structures and systems that ensure clarity and process based management. So think about communicating. So how are you communicating within your community? So um, to give an example, you may have like a community roadmap, which allows you to show like what are your plans for the community this year? And similarly to the strategy, you really want to create this with your community. So one of the things that we did in the data science community was that we did a survey of what people thought um, last year um, about like what we should do for 2021. And then this was incorporated in the community roadmap and then um, fed back at one of our community meetups so people can see what our plans were for like the community of interest as well as new ideas that we had for the community. Um, and then in the toolbox, I've just added in um, a really useful link to community channels in which you could possibly use for community and it's in the community club. Um, it's, it's hosted by the community club, which is a really amazing space for community managers and community builders alike who want to share knowledge and practice about how they're managing communities. Um, another way in which like you can um, build and provide agency in regards to decision making within communities is really dem demonstrated through Mickey Media's um, practice of a wish list. So essentially a wish list um, is an annual opportunity for community members to ask for features and fixes for Wikimedia Foundation to work on. The criteria are essentially are popularity, size, scope of the project, level of technical feasibility, risks, dependencies and potential risks with other communities. And this, this wish list process and enables people to dem uh, like democratize the decision making within a community. So like you can mobilize around a different feature, for example, and it like I think it's a, a really powerful way in which they allow enable decision making within Wikimedia. Um, I'm going to move on to another question to think about, but because of time, I won't necessarily get your feedback on. But like what encourages you to become a more active member of a community? So. One of those things that encourages people to become an active member of the community essentially is the experiences they have, as well as the ways in which they are engaged with. So one of the things that um, the Common Voice team have done with MOSFEST was team up with the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences and University of Groningen to host a contributor form. So as mentioned, Common Voice is a, um, a community-led um, uh, open source data set. And one of the things that the contributor, contributor form does is like, both showcase what Common Voice is, but also encourage contribution. So why would the team team up with um, the partners that they did? So Frisian is a spoken by 500,000 people, mostly in the Dutch province of Friesland, while there are 23 million Dutch speakers worldwide. Many voice technologies fail to recognize speech and even language due to the lack of data in voice, voice audio databases. 
and disenfranchising Dutch and Frisian speakers and users alike. So essentially working collaboratively with partners and they will, over the eight days of the Contributathon, help to encourage participation, but also showcase how um, students were using and researchers were using voice technology within their own work. And as a result, there was like over 110,000 10, 10, new Frisian clips and then 4,600 new clips in Dutch. So one of the things you want to consider about when you're engaging with the community and like curating that aspect of energy is like, how are you onboarding members? Like, how are you encouraging discussions? Are you, could you use, ask me any things? And so on and so forth. Am I for time? I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt at this point because I want to make sure that we have time for Arvon at it. That is really fascinating. If there, in, in terms of the slides, obviously you absolutely said we were we were going to share them, which is really super. And I think your additional questions are brilliant, and um, we can pop them into the chat and we can pop them into to Matrix and actually get people to feed back into that would be really really super. Um, and we'll we'll still have a few moments at the end of it, I think, for for questions, but. Um, I, I think we'll have to just call it a halt to make sure that we get um, Arvon in here and get it into it. Brilliant Definitely. talk. Fascinating. I've got lots of notes because it's given me lots of ideas. So thank you so much. Do you want to um, pop up your contact details or anything if you've got a final slide that you just wanted to quickly pop up? But um, And then Arvon, if you're at the ready to get going. Um, is it okay if I can put it into the matrix? Because I actually haven't put my contact details onto the slide. I just said thank you at the end. Yeah, <laughs> but thank you so much. And I definitely I'll share the slides and like my speaker notes thoroughly explain like all of the stuff I wanted to cover as well. So yeah. Cool. Thank Thanks you. so much. Um Arvon, I'm gonna quickly literally just hand it over to you and, and, and let you do the re oh my goodness, and do the rest of your introductions and I'll leave you to it. So um yeah, over to you. Yeah, perfect. All right. So thanks. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, yeah, I'm, my name is Arvon Smith. I am, uh, as I was introduced, I'm a, a product manager at GitHub. Um, I'm not going to be talking about my work there today, but I, I'm going to talk about um, a journal I run, which is called the Journal of Open Source Software, uh, which is uh, basically a sort of a intersection of um, peer review in a journal, but that happens uh, online in the open on GitHub. So um, these are my fellow editors, past and present. Um, wouldn't have been able to do this without uh, their help or all of the other, um, all of the reviewers uh, who've contributed their time. So just proof where I live, this is me, I'm in Edinburgh. I'm sorry we're not like hanging out in person, but someday perhaps I will get to meet you all. That would be fun. Um, we've had some very generous support from uh, some funders and uh, we're affiliated with the OSI and uh, a few other groups and they've been uh, very, uh, very important in our in our establishment as a journal. So the point of JOS is to recognize the value of software in modern research. So software is important. This is founded uh, the statement is founded in research, asking a bunch of researchers about how critical software is to their work and whether they'd be able to do their work without software. And it's it's pretty clear that software is cr a critical part of modern research in almost every discipline. Um, and software is everywhere. Um, I really like this phrase from Gail Varico, who's the, one of the Scikit-Learn creators, who describes the role of software um, throughout uh, throughout research, whether it's controlling an experiment, extracting data from uh, raw or, you know, software that encapsulates some kind of theory that we can prove or disprove. Um, and so in my world, you know, it's, I'm an astronomer by trade. We might use software to find signals of new planets going around other stars. In genomics, we might use these sort of next generation uh, sequencing technologies uh, to to uh, uh, sequence uh, whole genomes at very low cost. Or maybe it's in, uh, you know, simulating the universe in some kind of high computation um, uh, simulation of, of the world around us or in farming. Uh, John Deere is a software company now. That's not just, uh, that's not, uh, uh, that's a statement that they make, not just, uh, not that just that I make. You know, the, the software that runs on, on John Deere tractors and all their hardware is, is the sort of commercial edge that they have over their competitors. And so this, this has all been said. Uh, by somebody uh, uh, called Mark Andreessen, the software is eating the world, um, in, and it's in every industry and in every area of research. So software is critical. Problem is, and this is why JOSS really exists, is that software isn't really a creditable research activity. If you've worked in a research setting in academia and you've spent, let's say, too much, let's say in air quotes, time writing software, 
then that might have negatively affected your career uh, because there's a chance, especially if you've been releasing high quality community open source software, then that time that you spent on the software, which benefits you some way, but more, more importantly benefits your peers, people who use the software, um, that you trade that time for time that you could have spent perhaps writing papers. And so this is this is a problem. This is a problem that we need to fix if we want to keep doing the best research and we want to uh, support the people who create software. Just a very brief uh, segue into sort of why software is, isn't credible. It's basically a collection of cultural and technical reasons. Part of it is because we, we mostly think about software as um, uh, 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 as um, academic credit around things like papers. And so software isn't easily citable in papers um, and some journals won't support software. Uh, it isn't indexed when it is cited. So there's lots of cultural and technical reasons to go solve here. So there are two, two basic ways that I think about solving the way to recognize better the contribution of software and people creating software in, in uh, research. One is find some way to fit it software into uh, the current uh, publishing systems that we all have, that's papers and books, conference series, that kind of thing. The second is to evolve beyond this idea of I write a thing, people read it and then cite it, evolve beyond this sort of di one dimensional model. And in this second one, you might include data and methods as well as software. But number two is especially hard. Um, and so, you know, here are some ideas about uh, what, what makes that hard. So Joss is this idea of what if we just wrote papers about software? Um, this is this is a hack. Um, this is saying, let's say if I want to get cited for my work, I'm going to write a short paper. Then people can just cite that paper and I will sort of collect some uh, career credit through through citation, but of, of uh, papers. And so, you know, software papers are attractive in some sense because they, they enable citation by others. Uh, we don't really need to change any of the infrastructure that the scholarly communities do. And it, there's also advantages to publishing, you know, in a journal that all your peer group already recognize. So there's, there's, there's advantages there. So really, just is about making it as easy as possible to write and publish a software paper. So it's really about embracing um, this hack. And if people want to talk about some of the negative sides of doing this too, I'm all into that conversation, but this, I haven't got time to go into that today. So this is a very brief um, uh, overview of what JOST is, the Journal of Open Source Software. We call it a developer-friendly journal um, for research software packages. Uh, the idea is that you write a short paper that describes your software, its contribution, and that really that that's very close to like a well-written readme on GitHub. It's just basically saying what the purpose of it is, what problems it solves, maybe some comparison with other tools perhaps, but really a very short kind of uh, a paper, typically one to two pages. Um, and then um, we, we we put them through a review on GitHub. So the the, the sort of I think I've covered this actually, I'm gonna skip that. The goal is to basically make it a valuable service to authors, so minimize the additional effort beyond documenting software that we all should be doing already, minimize the author effort to produce a short paper, offer a constructive and open peer review process by, by, by experts, and the focus really should be on reviewing the software, its usability, whether it works, what could be improved about the docs, rather than focused heavily on some sort of novel um, uh, research results. So papers that get submitted to JOS do not, are not permitted to include new scientific results or research results. They must be about uh, the software. And the other thing, and this is kind of important, this is where sort of academia meets uh, open source. We wanted to leverage the best parts of open source workflows and conventions uh, where we could. So that means carrying out reviews on GitHub, um, and trying to, uh, you know, uh, foster a collaborative and welcoming community with a with a with a uh, transparent um, decision making process around editorial decisions, which is actually pretty unusual for journals. And use all the, the open source tools available, such as Pandoc, uh, to to make uh, the, the the experience um, uh, as uh, low low cost as possible. So leverage leverage open source tools in the sort of document production process. The last thing is, and this is kind of a defining feature, it turns out, for JOS, is automate as much as possible. If you've worked or interacted in 
uh, any sort of reasonably sizable open source community, you will find that there is a lot of automation going on that might be through like continuous integration with things like Travis and GitHub Actions, Circle CI, that kind of thing. But it might also be sort of bots that you interact with in pull requests and issues where there's some um, automation happening uh, to assist maintainers and contributors. And so th this is a big part of what we do at Joss to to reduce our um, uh, uh, sort of cost of cost of running the journal. So I want to just give you a very brief overview of what it looks like to actually submit and be reviewed at JOS. So this is a diagram uh, from our docs that kind of gives you a summary of what it looks like. I'm just going to quickly skip through. So people go to the uh, JOS website, you submit uh, a little bit of information in our form that describes the title of the submission, um, where the software is, and a few notes uh, for the uh, for the editorial team. And very quickly, the software ends up on GitHub in a review issue. So there's a, this is the repository, Open Journals, Josh Reviews. And this is basically just a collection of issues on GitHub where people are talking to each other and reviewing software. So the first thing we do is uh, we have an editorial robot that uh, introduces themselves, tries to compile the paper. So this is this automation right from the get go here. The paper is being compiled. Also, the programming languages are being detected and the paper proof, a proof of the PDF is posted into the um, into the issue. Uh, here we have a managing editor. This is Kyle, who was uh, on rotation this week, asking um, a couple of the editors who are specialists in in this topic area if they have some capacity to take on this paper. And so Lorena here agrees, which is great. And then uh, the author here is actually suggesting some reviewers. So, you know, if you're looking for people who could give a good review, um, then then here are some of my suggestions. Um, then the managing editor asks the robot to assign Lorena as the editor and the robot responds. And then sure enough, we have a, 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 a reviewer saying, I'm actually interested in helping out review this. Uh, and Lorena says, thank you, and assigns um, the first reviewer to, to the submission. And then looks like the second person also volunteered to review. So this is kind of like a dream experience if you're an editor, people just volunteering to review, which is always very nice rather than having to chase down potential reviewers too hard. Um, and then um, just doing a few sort of pre-flight checks before uh, uh, starting the review. Lorena is asking uh, the robot to check uh, for missing DOIs. So again, this is part of our automation, trying to produce good metadata when we publish, and then starting the review. So every uh, paper on uh, JOS goes through, uh, has two issues. One is like the clearinghouse where we assign the editor and find reviewers. The second is where the actual review takes place. And this review process was actually inherited from the R open Sci community. I don't know, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a community of researchers publishing very nice um, packages in the R programming languages uh, with a focus on open science. And so these, the issue has the, the, the information about the editor, the reviewers and the author and also a badge that can be included in your readme. And then there's a checklist for each reviewer that they work through and they sort of work through that. And as they go open up issues on the on the repository as they um, as they go through the review process. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the review here. Editors uh, are doing some last checks. The paper's now being reviewed. The software has been reviewed. The checklists have been uh, uh, completed and we take an archive of the software, then we, uh, the, this is now our um, editor in chief on rotation here, also called Lorena, com uh, confusingly, but different Lorena now, um, who's asking Whedon to do a sort of pre-submission check, check that it's ready to go. And then there's the last stop, which is deposit for, for real. And our robot likes emoji, as you can tell, tweets a link to the paper and the paper's published. And all of that happens uh, in the issue. There's no manual, uh, production process on the part of the editors. So this is this is like a big, big deal uh, compared to most editorial uh, po uh, processes. And this is the final published paper on the website. So just to give you an idea of sort of scale we're working at, we've covered currently over the last five years, we've published about 1300 papers in JOS now. Um, and I actually need to update this graphic. I forgot to before this morning. So I projected we'd be publishing about our thousandth paper in about June. I think it was about that was about right. Um, and and so I just want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about what I mean by where open source meets peer review. And so, 
you know, when I think about open source, you know, open source is this right to use, modify, and share, but it doesn't say anything about contribution. There's a there's a different term that I prefer, um, and I think this is in many ways pretty uh, compatible with what Hillary was just talking about. This idea of open collaborations that are about this has now words about what it means to work collaboratively in the open and be receptive to contributions uh, from from a broad community from anyone who shows interest. And this is a definition from Carl Fogel, who literally wrote uh, one of the books about uh, open source software. And so the idea behind Joss is, can we make a journal that has these same ideals? So I'm committing a, a bit of a sin here by using uh, the wrong logo for GitHub, but I'm using the old one because it used to say social coding. And you know, in many ways, what we're doing at Joss here is trying to emulate what popular projects do, and I'm going to skip through a little bit for time here, but where people can, you know, um, um, work openly, like a project like AstroPy, work openly, open issues for each other, um, make make contributions in the open, discuss those changes with each other. If you've seen a popular GitHub project that does this well, people are not only contributing code changes on GitHub, but are also, you know, working on docs together and governance and the whole kind of process is open. And in many ways, if you look at the sort of scale that GitHub is working at, I believe there are something like 2 million research articles per, pub, published per year. Um, there are something on the order of 100 million pull requests annually on GitHub. And I think of GitHub as the biggest peer review platform on the planet. Uh, it just happens to be that lots of that peer review is not of uh, academic content, but just software. And so in many ways, you know, open, these open source projects are sustained by contributors and maintainers and, and, you know, that growing a contributor base and being receptive to uh, uh, con contributions, code, documentation, discussions. There's this sort of new, really open source uh, that sort of started with the Node.js communities about how it, what it looks like to try and uh, be sort of radically open and um, uh, open to new contributors. And so, you know, collaborative open source has this idea of, you know, create more users through education, encourage, have a liberal contribution policy, and you know help people um, become leaders through um, uh, participatory governance, and these are all uh, traits that we're trying to uh, uh, mimic in Joss. And so uh, there's this idea of sort of a contributor funnel in um, in open source. This is uh, written in a blog post by my colleague Mike McQuaid, who's the main maintainer of Homebrew. He talks about this transition from users to contributors to maintainers. I'm just going to skip through this. Uh, in Joss, I think we have a similar contributor flow. I'm not sure if it's people are reviewers first, then become authors, then become editors, or whether it's actually a little bit different, um, where it's authors first, reviewers, then editors. But there is this contributor flow that we uh, see and that we encourage. And so that's really encouraging for us. The last thing I wanted to say, and I'm very nearly done, I promise, Samantha, uh, is you know, bot-assisted communities are a big part of open source these days. I showed you our robot. And I think you know, one thing I would uh, encourage everyone to go look at is this idea of webhooks and this sort of asynchronous, um, you know, there's webhooks on uh, GitHub, on GitLab, on Bitbucket, this idea of having activity happen in your community and then automating uh, uh, behavior and this is there's a huge amount of uh, uh, work that goes on in this space so last but not least if you're interested in just how it works we've written up how all of this work that we've done has allowed us to run a very low-cost journal it's about cost us about two quid per paper uh, to um, to publish and that's zero cost to authors and um, yeah so we like to think of just as a collaboration between authors editors and reviewers and that feels pretty good to us. So thanks so much for your time. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Arvon. That was really, really interesting. Um, and I'm having a moment of, of, of clarity there around names and things like that by a comment that's just gone into um, into Matrix, but I, now's not maybe the time to get into that particular point just now. Um, we've had uh, lots of interest on uh, both talks. So, uh, Hilary, I hope we still have you there. We've probably got time for at least a question each. So I'm actually going to um, I'm going to start with you, Arvon, just because one's just popped up there and, and and a quote from Derek, this is a brilliant idea, instead of using a traditional publication model to publish an application note. The question is, a big deal in my field is to have a paper searchable on the PubMed repository. Mm -hmm. Is it possible for one of these papers to get a pub 
Med ID, and I'm hoping you yes, understand more than I do. I do, and I thank you for asking. I'm delighted to say yes very soon. So PubMed requires um, this thing called JATS, J Journal Article Transport System or something. It requires a particular format um, uh, to be ingested into their system, and we're actually working on that right now. In fact, in five minutes, I'm going to go talk to somebody about that. So um, yes, we we do know what it's going to look like to get um, indexed by PubMed, and it's on our to-do list. We're already indexed by Google Scholar, uh, but we're not in PubMed yet, but we should be soon. So thanks for the question. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'm still hoping that made more sense to the person that got it back than, than, than it does to me. But it's always something to learn. Uh, Hilary, lots of interest about your talk. Lots of thanks for it and about real practical ideas. So a couple of really interesting questions around it. So um, one of them is actually around um, burnout. How about burnout within the network and how would you approach it? The person says, I definitely saw burnout within my community work and I don't know how widespread that is. Um, I'll start on it from like an individual level and then also in terms of like the how you can apply it to your community so like I think it's so important to have self-care um, as a community manager because like a lot of what you're doing is collaborating with people trying to like fix like problems and so on and so forth and like if you expend yourself too much it's quite bad and it might be also because you need to delegate more because you've taken up too much like tasks that you could possibly give to someone else that has skills, even better skills than you yourself. So I think starting from that is a good point. One thing that's helped me in regards to like, as in practically, is using like scheduling tools to think about like, what will require for me to do a community of interest event. One thing that I learned from retrospect from doing that tool though, is actually including annual leave <laughs> because um, both my roles have been like full-time roles. Um, and like, if you don't consider things as annual leave or even like things such as pandemic, like you're going to overexpend yourself. In terms of the last bit, I think it's really about like setting expectations and then also adjusting what you're requiring people to do. Because even when we were doing the government data science festival, there were some tasks that some people had to do more because there wasn't as enough responses for certain strands. So they had to take up more work. And I think it's important to acknowledge that and then see if, where you can step in and support that person. Um, and I think it's also good to like have like community breaks, so like periods where like there is stillness, because I think stillness is quite important. Like engagement isn't like running into traffic; it's like about being like consistent in the quality and stuff. Oh yeah, I hope that makes sense as an analogy because I had the most strange response, but yeah, thank you for the question. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, I was going to ask the other question to you, um, uh, Arvon, about, but I see you put a little note of it into. Um, uh, into Matrix, but for the sake of anyone that's not looking at Matrix, the question was, are there any paid staff at JOS and does GitHub subsidize it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we do not have any paid staff. Um, that's kind of the point for us that we want to not um, set ourselves up in a position where we need to fund um, individuals. So it's purely volunteer based. Um, there are challenges with that, of course. We have had some funding support from um, some foundations for s developing specific features, um, like the software development, but the operating costs are covered by um, uh, are covered by those grants and um, and small number of donations we get from the community. And other than the providing GitHub to users, there are no there's no support from GitHub. No. That's brilliant. Thank you. And I'm I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to call it a halt because we've hit two o'clock and I know there's lots of interest. So um, if, if both of you are able to join Matrix, I think actually maybe both of you are already there. Um, and uh, there's a couple more questions for both of you. So uh, if you do have a small moment to, to possibly answer them, we'd very much appreciate it. And if anyone hasn't been able to ask a question yet, um, please pop it through onto onto Matrix and, um, and you can get an answer there. Thank you both of you so much but totally different angles. And again, it's just so interesting to see all the different aspects of um, uh, what these areas mean to be, uh, mean to all of us and how we can kind of interact together as community and, uh, you know, create really useful solutions that make things work in a better way. And um, there was a quote went on to Matrix, which was automate everything. And maybe that's a good takeaway for today is, yeah, we should automate everything and make our lives a little easier for it. So uh, thank you again. Now, um, I'm actually going to refer back to the team from, um, uh, 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 Edinburgh are at this point about what's happening tomorrow at lunchtime. Um, is there anything we can fill in there, either from yourself, Greg, or from Mike, that you want to say about tomorrow lunchtime? 
So I'm, I'm giving Mike a chance. I'm giving Mike a chance. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm turning on cameras and things. Uh, so we have uh, Sian um, Baska, who is uh, a CEO at Data Orchard. Um, you may have come across their Data Maturity Index. It's um, being trialled by the Scottish Government at the moment um, and is used a lot in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, so you across universities and public services and charities, uh, and increasingly in um, in the for-profit, the private sector. Uh, I will drop a link to the chat in it, but it, it quite neatly rounds up a lot of the things we've talked about over the past three days as, as well around culture and skills and leadership and tools. Um, so I think that's going to be fantastic. Um, we are at the moment uh, wondering about having a very short 10 minute roundup of what we've heard over the, the four days so far. Uh, and then I think there'll be a brief discussion led by Greg about what we will do on Friday. Um, do you want to step in and say anything, Gregor, if I covered it all? Um, no, I think that's fine. We have uh, a planning document in the matrix room, um, or I can show, I keep showing the link occasionally because people are struggling with the widget, it seems. Um, but um, current votes are for some kind of unconference session on Friday with topics uh, being filled out on the pad, uh, which is popular. So I think tomorrow we might well have to get together and decide what Friday looks like so I can create the rooms ahead of time. That's brilliant. Thanks so much. And we hope you can join us tomorrow and um, Friday with what's coming up. And uh, thank you again for joining us at lunchtime. We hope you have a lovely le uh, rest of the day. And thanks to the rest of the organisation team for making everything work today. And uh, thanks again to the speakers and um, goodbye to everybody. <laughs>